Hello and welcome to week three of Communication Law, Ethics and Diversity. This week we progress into examining the First Amendment. You may have already read that First Amendment document. You may say to yourself, well, we're looking at the freedom of information and the freedom of speech and all of those different freedoms that are enshrined in the Constitution. You'll know that it's much more than that when we come to speaking to issues around the First Amendment. I've already posted the slides and I trust that you've had a chance to look through it, but I'm going to go ahead and share my slides with you so that we can actually go through the slides together and form um, a more informed, I would say, opinion or discussion around the First Amendment. You will notice also that I've posted a new video that really reflects on the evolution or the formation of the First Amendment and it's framed as the freedom of conscience. And you will see that because we are thinking beings, and that's the reason why it is important for the First Amendment in terms of the freedom of speech to be allowed to function and to um, foster what we call democratic engagement. So it's very, very important that we understand the entire scope of the First Amendment, its original intention, and of course, how it has evolved over time in society, specifically in US society. Now, what are the major tenets of the First Amendment? And we know that the First Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights. And of course, the First Amendment really guarantees certain rights and freedoms to citizens of the United States. The freedom of expression that allows journalists and media to operate freely, this is actually one of the guaranteed rights of the First Amendment. Then we also have the text itself that says Congress shall by Congress rather shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibit, prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So we have here a compilation of freedoms or rights um, whereby Congress has agreed to make sure that these are exercised freely in the context of religion, in the context of what we say, in the context of our ability to assemble or to petition the government. And in the context of religion, we see that there are two tiers. There is this whole notion of I have a right to actually freely exercise my religious beliefs. And I also have a right to reject any imposition when it comes to religion and my own beliefs, so to speak. All right. Um, I have a right to speak um, the truth. I have a right to speak my truth. And I also have a right to reject anything that appears to be mysteries. And we're living in an interesting era where everyone has access to technology and media. And so uh, particularly in the era that we're living in, we've got to be very mindful of overreaching where those freedoms are concerned. And of course, later on, you hear that there are some types of speeches that are not protected under the First Amendment, contrary to what many may believe um, exists in the Constitution. Now, what does it mean in terms of these freedoms that we're talking about under the First Amendment? Um, freedom from religion, this is in the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, and this has to do with my freedom to choose not to bow down, my freedom to choose not to be able to pray in schools. And that's the reason why you will find that a lot of arguments around um, a nation that is um, you know, separated from church, in, in fact, the separation of the church and the state, that's the argument that you'll get from people who will say that, well, you have no right to force me to pray. Um, a lot of people have won cases of reason because you're exercising your right to exercise your freedom of religion. If you're kneeling, that is your right to exercise your freedom of religion. But if somebody says, oppositionally speaking, I don't want to kneel, I don't want you to force me, they're also exercising this particular right here which is called the freedom from religion. So this is the establishment clause. I've already touched on the freedom of religion. It means that I can stop in the middle of a match and I can say to my team, let us pray so that we can win this particular championship or this tournament, all right? So that is the double-edged aspect of, or the two-pronged aspect of this particular um, freedom here in the First Amendment. Then there's a free speech clause whereby 
um, you know, reporters have a right to. And of course, this is freedom of the press, but if somebody's a public figure, they should be allowed to exercise free speech. If we're talking about religion again, that person should be allowed to preach. And it's in the context of free speech that they're preaching. If it's a public speaker, they are not supposed to be suppressed or stopped. Um, they should be able to exercise that right to the freedom of speech. Now, this very sacred one here that you hear reference to in the video that I posted recently, this has to do with the freedom of the press in terms of the ability of the media to generate information because we know that media, much of what um, people who are operating as media, um, you know, uh, you know, journalists or reporters or however they're actually framed, somebody who's a newsmaker or producer, um, they have freedom that is seen in the context of engagement. And so very much embedded in, in, in the freedoms is this whole notion of promoting a democracy, a freedom that is able to give people all sides of an issue, a freedom that is able to open up spaces where you can actually, um, you know, ask questions, so to speak. So freedom of the press really speaks to the ability of journalists to be watchdogs and to see exactly when they're excessive in government and to see exactly who is involved. And so in a lot of cases, you will find that the freedoms are um, stymied if there is corruption in some societies that do not necessarily subscribe to freedom of the press. They are called authoritarian societies. You will find that they do not necessarily want reporters to um, engage in reporting facts and the truth because it really paints them in a bad light. So there are very few societies that are actually engaging in this type of suppression. Freedom suppression or suppression of information because that's not what they're used to. They're not democracies. And so the foundation of a democracy, one of the hallmarks, one of the major indicators of a democracy is the extent to which the press is free to gather and to report on information without um, being penalized. There is um, you know, a, a, an agency, an establishment called Reporters Without Borders and what they do on an annual basis, they do a survey um, on media freedoms around the world and they will let you know what reporters are gone missing, who's been beheaded, who's been persecuted or persecuted as a result of exercising freedom that we so freely enjoy here in the United States. Then there is the next freedom, which is peaceful assembly. If it's an assembly that is not necessarily reflective of the January 6th insurrection happened in 2020, then it can be classified as a peaceful assembly. What happened in January 2020 was not a peaceful assembly because it was a breach of the Capitol, that's number one. Number two, it was a very um, egregious to a lot of people. It resulted in death and injury. Um, it resulted in long-term injury in some cases for those who were in law enforcement. Uh, there were at least, uh, you know, there was at least one person who jumped through one of the windows who was killed, who was shot. And of course, a lot of testimonies came out of the January 6th commission. So peaceful assembly would be those that are classified as being very orderly. And those types of um, protests, action that will not lead to mayhem and confusion and so social upheaval. Um, those types that will lead to, um, we're going to stand right here until we get answers from our lawmakers. Uh, we're going to go on a hunger strike. We're going to go on a fast. We're going to be camping out, but we're doing so in a way that does not bring harm to those particular persons that we're trying to actually get their attention. Um, the petition clause is very, very closely related to assembly, meaning that you can actually have a peaceful assembly because you're trying to have some sort of grievance address. So redress of grievances, you can have this as well as a right. You can have them um, as an assembly, maybe starting as an assembly. And then of course, there will be letters written um, repetitively so that the attention of the particular policymakers can be had by those persons who are actually seeking a redress um, of grievances. Now, freedom from religion, if I were to actually articulate in a very um, cogent way what this actually means, the establishment clause really prevents the government from creating a church or endorsing a particular religion in general or favoring one set of religious beliefs over another. And I know that many of you might have been exposed to the multiple views around one party versus another, one administration versus another, um, particularly under the last administration, um, there was a lot of evangelical following 
um, for the, um, you know, the public Republican Party, you know, vis-a-vis -vis President Trump. And so there was that presence or that dominance of the Christian religion. Historically speaking, I believe that there has been that particular religious association with the Republicans and Christianity. And so people have always or often questioned those particular types of orientations to religion when it comes to politics in the United States. Um, at the US Supreme Court, really a decision taken in 1947, Everson versus the Board of Education of Ewing Township, we see the establishment clause there set up and it was really intended to erect a wall of separation between the church and the state. Um, although the degree to which the government should really have become accommodating religion in public life, it has been debated over time in a number of Supreme Court decisions since this particular era in 1947. Um, um, the example that I brought to you earlier that has to do with that separation or that stance now, um, there was this particular person, this coach who won his case in the court because um, you know, he was proselyting. He was kneeling to pray before the particular match and that's a custom that he would engage in. And it was said that he was exercising is right. Um, teachers and prayer in schools, this is also something that has been debated over time because the, the argument on the one side is that if you take prayer out of schools, there's going to be more, um, you know, things that are not of, not of a valuable nature or, or, or immorality is going to take over uh, what is happening in the, those particular settings. So that has been the argument. We've got to keep religion there so that we can keep people on the straight and narrow. Um, on the other hand, the argument in terms of the separation, it's that particular right of individuals, of parents to know that when they send their children to school, they're not being indoctrinated by some form of uh, religious belief that is um, actually extended or imparted by the educator. And so those arguments have evolved over time in terms of are we really um, you know, following the establishment clause in our schools on the basis of the particular political administration that is in power. So freedom from religion has really changed over time in terms of what people have reported. And then freedom of religion, which is really what the First Amendment clause here, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting really um, this, this ability of, of, of people to actually you know, exercise their beliefs and stuff like that. This is something that is allowed as part of the First Amendment. So prayer, like I said, um, this can be done proselytizing. Um, this can be done wearing a hijab or religious clothing, such as, you know, your mouths or head scarves. This can be done because this is freedom of religion being exercised by people. So whereas freedom from religion really shields uh, the individual who decides not to kneel, because of their right, freedom of religion allows the person who is actually uh, Bible believing or they're you know, from the Islamic faith or they're Hindu or whatever it is, they can actually um, exercise that religious freedom in a public space or privately speaking because it's enshrined in the constitution. So they also have a right not to believe in any religion and of course the right not to participate in religious activity when it comes to the freedom um, of if the person is agnostic or if they're atheist, all right? Now we come to this that is really more closely associated with what you will do as media students and perhaps what you need to understand if you're going to go up into industry. And this has to do with freedom of speech and of the press. Now the First Amendment really allows citizens to express and to be exposed to a wide range of opinions and views. And this is where the democratic markers come into the piece because our exposure really would be today to social media platforms, to traditional media. Of course, there are citizen journalists as well. We've got our friends reporting information to us. And so really, at the time that this was written, we did not have the technologies that are available today. And so it was really intended to ensure a free exchange of ideas, even if the ideas are unpopular. But right now we see political movers and shakers, those persons who are involved in different policies, they're, you know, they have access to a number of, of platforms. And so idea sharing is becoming, you know, widespread in, in, in our culture and in the society, whereas everybody has a bit of information from both sides. And so the electorate and so people, citizens 
they have the ability to think for themselves and to understand all the various perspectives that they're getting from the politicians or those policymakers, or whether it's information pertaining to health care. Um, there are different sides and there are different contexts that will be shared as a result of the freedoms found in the freedom of the press. So you have traditional media, and then you have those um, press um, establishments that are using online platforms. Now, freedom of speech and of the press means that they have a freedom to speak or to write. Um, they have a freedom to actually do so in those traditional spaces, as in television news and broadcasts, and of course, for those persons who are known as journalists who will write for newspapers, but now you have a merging of those platforms, and so you can actually look at um, something streaming online, and so the freedoms are now transcending the technology, and it's crossing borders as a result of what is happening. So in many cases, the world is benefiting from the First Amendment, this particular freedom of speech and of the press, because the world knows what is happening in the United States in real time as a result of those freedoms. Um, then we have what is called nonverbal communication, such as sit-ins and art and photographs and films and advertisements. All of these are expressions because the freedom of the, of the press is not just confined to journalism. Um, you can have someone who is expressing themselves in artwork as a form of protest. You can have photographs showing the plight of a particular group of people. You can have films that depict politics. Sometimes you will see documentaries that are really non-fictional. Um, in film, we call, you know, anything that is fictional, things that are actually coming from maybe a book and it's adopted for film or it's coming from the creators of whatever they're thinking through in the context of sometimes a real issue. And so they'll, they'll be altering the characters and stuff like that in the names. But films and advertisements and all of this, this has to do with freedoms. Um, you, you, you find that there are people who are advertising on their particular, um, I would say, you know, opinions about <laughs> a politician, their endorsements. And so around every election cycle, you'll find this as framed as freedom of information or freedom of speech. Um, I remember having a discussion around, you know, how the ads have been really valorizing in some cases, some candidates and some other people, they have been demonizing them. Um, and I said to them, if you want to stop that, I said to the professor, then it means that you're, you're asking for a constitutional reform. You're asking for the framers of the constitution to remove what is called the freedom of speech because anybody can use it once it's not necessarily thrown out of context. All of those particular commercials, those political ads are really um, located under the First Amendment right of that particular party, that establishment, to promote their candidate. Whether or not the information is erroneous or it's slanderous, it's a totally different question or concept or construct or issue altogether. But all of these particular ads that you will see, it falls under the freedom of speech, all right? Some of it may be exaggerated in some cases when it comes to ads, but it's the freedom of speech with the assumption that we are rational beings and we're able to pick up anything that is not factual. Now, freedom of speech and of the press where the media are concerned, it includes television, radio, and the internet. And of course, all of these particular actors are free to distribute a wide range of news, facts, opinions, and pictures. And the amendment protects the speaker and the recipient of the information. It means that whoever is actually broadcasting is protected as a speaker. And I'm also protected as a recipient, you're protected as a recipient because you have a right to that information, all right? You have a right to read, to see, and to hear, and of course, to obtain a broad range of point of view, points of view rather, of course, um, that right should not be withheld at any time. Now, I should let you know that freedom of speech is not necessarily, the speech of the press, that is, it is not an absolute, all right? The Supreme Court really has ruled that the government sometimes may be allowed to limit speech. And of course, those limits can be imposed on issues around defamation. And you're not necessarily getting the information that, you know, is of a factual nature. It's not truthful. It's putting the person in a bad light, as we say legally. 
and it's dishonoring the person's character, defaming the person's character. So that's the reason why you will have what we call a defamation of character in the case of libel and slander. Of course, obscenity is also not protected. Fighting words and words that present a clear and present danger of inciting violence. Um, we will actually discuss this in the you know, exceptions in our speech distinction, but I'd like you to think about how the January 6th incident occurred and how it unfolded and the arguments that were made by the January 6th committee in terms of the witnesses that came forward. Um, you know, their argument, their core argument that, you know, you know, caused that particular incident to be addressed um, at that level. Core argument is that it was an incitement of violence or an incitement to violence that caused the folks to march down to the Capitol. Think about it and think about all of those other issues that you might have seen emerge out of somebody saying something and suddenly um, a person's are descending in a particular area. And so that's the reason why there's some exceptions to the freedom of speech. Um, the government may also regulate speech by limiting the time, the place, or the manner in which it is made. And of course, um, the killing, you will see much more of that. Now, when it comes to the freedom of assembly and the right to petition the government, First Amendment really protects the freedom of assembly, um, which can be mean, like I said, physically gathering with a group of people to pick it up protests. You have placards there and you're not actually getting into any confrontation. Many In, many, in some instances, there have been um, particular freedoms of assembly and the right to petition that have turned out very violent. There have been clashes with law enforcement that is no longer some sort of peaceful assembly, all right? And so you have a right to be able to you have a right to be able to associate with another group um, for economic, political, or religious purposes as well. That particular freedom of assembly gives you that right to associate. Um, the First Amendment also protects the right not to associate in the same way that you have to I'll be allowed to exercise that right. You can also choose not to be in that in group when it comes to the freedom of assembly which means that the government or no harm can force people to actually join a group that they do not wish to join. And let's go back to the issues around the striking down of Roe v. Wade. Let's argue that for a moment, you know, there is one political side versus another where the striking down is concerned. And we know that it affected women on both sides of the political divide. If one side were to argue, well, it is really moral to abort, or to do whatever it is um, in terms of killing the unborn, there is no way that they can force um, their supporters to actually join um, and add their voices into this whole argument around we need to save lives, all right? Even if there are knowingly people who feel very strongly about that particular issue, they cannot necessarily be forced to join on the basis of you need to join with us and show that you're with us. You know, this whole notion of you're either for us or against us, you have a right. Anyone who is actually affiliated politically, they have a right to say no to that particular assembly because they're exercising their freedom of assembly that is enshrined in the First Amendment. So this is the reason why a lot of cases have been brought up as well in terms of people being penalized or being sanctioned because they did not associate with a particular protest action or assembly. A related right really we see is the right to petition the government, including everything from signing a petition to filing a lawsuit. Now, there's some, in some cases, the First Amendment is misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, we don't know sometimes who those people are, but in some cases, you know, you find that, um, you know, you ask to name, uh, you know, as a naturalized citizen of the United States, you know, here, I, when, I, when, I, when I got to that place of being tested, this is, this is one of the, the major things that they would ask you, you know, you name one of the rights on the, the First Amendment, you know, um, you know, the First Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights, all of these things. But sometimes um, Americans are not aware, citizens are not aware of what the First Amendment actually has en enshrined in it and stuff like that. And so a poll was actually conducted. 37% could not name one of the five freedoms. And I hope that you don't find that shocking. Um, I trust that you know all five of the freedoms, uh, that at least you will internalize and remember them by the end of this particular session. Um, another 39% said that Congress should not be able to prevent the press from reporting on national security issues without government approval. Of course, reporters can already do that, all right? So again, the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. 
So the First Amendment protects the reporters. Of course, um, there are certain you know, differences or there are certain, um, uh, I would call it exceptions that I will discuss with you later on. Now, because the <laughs> First Amendment begins with Congress shall make no law, it says that Congress, you know, they have no power to actually do that. Um, they cannot touch what is enshrined in the Constitution. And of course, it only applies to the federal and local government. In other words, the First Amendment protects people against the government and not other people or private companies. Um, so the principle is also referred to as a state action doctrine. Of course, the Constitution and its protection of rights and quality applies to the government as well. So private conduct really does not have to comply with the Constitution. This leads me to the fact that platforms like Instagram and YouTube, they're private. They can take down your content at any time without violating your First Amendment rights. So therefore, it means that those persons who are holding are responsible for the platforms, they can exercise their freedom of removing your particular content. So it's not the government we're talking about here now. This is private establishment that is actually the internet service provider, or I would say um, the social media platform that is actually responsible as a repository for your details or your information, they can actually take it down without being cited for violating your First Amendment rights. Now, there are a couple of speech restrictions and there are some types that I'd like to share with you next. And so we have what is called the content-based versus the content-neutral restriction. And so the content-based law or regulation discriminates against speech based on substance of what it communicates. And so the substance has to do with what is it that you're trying to say to people that is likely to be um, you know, explosive. Let's go back again to the January 6th speech. If someone um, gets wind of the fact that you are going to do a speech that will actually stimulate violence, they can apply what we call a content-based law or regulation. Of course, this is discriminatory and we say that it's a restriction, all right? A content neutral law on the other hand applies to expression without regard to its substance. So nobody knows what you're going to talk, but it's just really a content neutral. The Supreme Court is likely to strike down regulations that discriminate on that particular basis um, because it's really purely subjective, all right? So, Really, people are not supposed to be stopping you. You know, if, if it goes to the court, they will say, well, um, how do you know that's what is happening? There has to be a preponderance of evidence that suggests that there's going to be incitement based on the content-based law that is applied, um, based on the, the substance. And of course, if it's content neutral, how are you going to stop them when they're exercising their First Amendment right? So content-based laws are presumed unconstitutional. All right, it's a designation of a law as you know either content based or content neutral, and it's an important first step in actually establishing whether there is a violation of the First Amendment. If there are content based laws that are there, they're actually presumed to be unconstitutional as well because they're subject to strict, strict scrutiny. That is, and of course, the highest form of judicial review. Um, whereas, on the other hand, for content based neutral or content neutral laws, rather, um, they will survive. Um, only intermediate scrutiny, meaning it's not going to go very far in the court of law when it comes to checking to see exactly um, whether the particular standards that were exercised to stop the person from actually expressing themselves were really objective, all right? There must be a reason for actually applying those particular laws in the context of content-based laws based on presumption. And of course, you're measuring that against the First Amendment or the Constitution um, of the United States. Um, there's this whole notion of content-based and viewpoint discrimination that has occurred as well in the past. This has to do with um, the government regulation that is seeking to restrict expression based not only on its content, but on the underlying views of the message. So if someone were to be giving a view about politics, so to speak, all right, and it has to do with politics on the basis of um, religious values or morality. Um, this, you know, if law, a law is applied and the station decides not to broadcast or to hear the particular commentary, um, they can be actually cited for a viewpoint discrimination because let's say it's Fox or CNN, let's say Fox decides that they're not going to have someone who has a viewpoint 
on the right to abort on the basis of the content. But because they're talking specifically about, you know, uh, the, the right to, you know, choose and it's your body and stuff like that, because the underlying views are more um, of a liberal nature, um, and because Fox may be deemed to be conservative, then it is really a violation of that person's constitutional right, their First Amendment right, for Fox News to actually apply what is called the content-based and viewpoint discrimination by not necessarily hearing the person's viewpoint or cutting them off midway through the interview. So that's an example. Um, and what content-based restrictions will actually do to limit speech based on the subject matter, and of course, the viewpoint-based restrictions will limit, limit, limit speech based on the ideology and perspective. The example that I gave you earlier in terms of the subject matter, let's say the subject matter is abortion, you will find that the content-based restriction will be applied to that particular person who is actually speaking. Now, the viewpoint-based restriction will be based on, let's say it's a political ideology and perspective coming from um, a Democrat, all right? If the ideology is a freedom of choice and this perspective is it's, it's my body, it's my right, then you will find that that application there is what will happen with somebody who's trying to restrict the content. Um, so a ban invariably on political speeches in a public park would be content-based because it's of a political or ideological nature. And of course, a law banning only political speeches by members of the Socialist Party would be viewpoint-based. So those are the distinctions that I'd like you to take account of in the context of how bans are sometimes applied and how these are really in contravention of people's First Amendment rights. Then we move to what is called the public forum doctrine. This is from the state action doctrine. And we know that the First Amendment only applies to public properties and not private ones. And when a government body is the one restricting the speech. So the public forum doctrine really has to do with what the state is trying to do, restrictively speaking. And of course, the government is the body that is actually applying that restriction. And so courts have identified about three different types of public property and provided guidelines as to whether or how the government can restrict the speech in each category. Um, in the first instances, places that traditionally have been open for citizens to speak freely, streets, parks, and sidewalks, um, they cannot close public forums without compelling a reason, a compelling reason rather. And of course, it has to be content neutral, meaning the restrictions can apply to time, place and manner of speech. So if there are particular times and place um, where there's encumbrance, they can actually apply some sort of um, doctrine to, 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 to restrict the use there. Um, here's an example. Um, they cannot prevent anyone from holding a pro-choice or pro-life protest on public streets um, because that's a person's perspective. They can't restrict it. It would be content-based, which is not allowed on public forum. All right? So this is an example here of them um, not being able to prevent, but of course, um, this has to do with public forum doctrine being applied. Now, they can put some sort of time limit or restriction with good reason, because like I said, if there's going to be an encumbrance in a public place um, at a time when somebody wants to stand and to give a speech, then it means that it's going to be problematic in the context of what it is they're trying to do. And some examples here would be, you know, if you want to have your protest or your speech delivered or your gathering between 4 and 7 p.m., that's the peak time. The argument that they can bring is that this is the rush hour, so we can't have your particular meeting at that time. All right. Um, you know, if, if there's this, you know, issue of no consideration for pro-life or pro-choice and they're not applying the religious argument, then they can say that blocking traffic is going to be a problem. And of course, it is content neutral and it's allowed under the public forum doctrine. They can apply a content neutral law to actually stop people from um, blocking traffic. Then we have what is called a limited or designated public forum. This has to do with placing places that are designated for certain types of speech, but they're not generally open to the public. You've got to obtain permission before. And this has to do with places like your university's public lecture hall or a meeting room. Permission has to be granted to use those particular spaces. The site of a city owned bus reserve for advertisements, this is another place. You've got to have some permission. And of course, they can't discriminate. That is the government. They cannot discriminate on viewpoint, but time and place restrictions can be imposed, like I explained in the other um, slide that I was sharing. Now, there's also what we call the non public forum, 
here by government-owned facilities that are traditionally not open for speeches, you cannot use those places. These include office buildings, jails, military bases, airports, and of course, content-based restrictions are allowed in these instances because you cannot necessarily be using a jail to have some sort of speech because we know that there are inmates inside. There are military bases that are reserved for just military operations and airports have you know, very heavy traffic. So you cannot necessarily be encumbering in these areas. Um, they have to do with security risks, so to speak. All right. So an example here, the government can actually prevent you from holding a protest inside the IRS building, although the building is owned by the government and is considered public property, not a place that you want people to be because it can be restrictive um, when it comes to the IRS getting its work done because of the nature of what happens or occurs at the IRS. Then we have what is called the overbreath and vagueness doctrines. The overbreath doctrine really is that regulation of speech that can sweep too broadly, thereby prohibiting protected as well as non-protected speech. Um, and this has to do with restricting more speech than necessary or allowed. Um, it is a regulation of speech that is unconstitutional. Um, it's deemed to be overbroad if it regulates a substantial amount of constitutionally protected expression. And so if a journalist has a right to bring news and information, um, you, you, know, you cannot necessarily use overbreadth and vagueness doctrine to say that the person is leading in a certain direction. So you're regulating speech by not necessarily explaining what clause you're using to exercise that unconstitutional type of doctrine, which is called the overbreadth doctrine. Um, you know, the example here, like I brought is like, you know, if you have a situation where you know, Kennesaw or um, where we are directly in terms of Clayton County, they have a law and they're saying that any protest on, um, you know, the, the, one of the major streets that we use, um, you know, on, 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 on the campus here, or one of those particular sidewalks, um, the courts would likely strike it down as overly broad. And of course, it's going to be deemed to be unconstitutional. So Main Street is not necessarily um, it's going to be North Avenue, all right, or you know, one of those places that are very, very close to the Clayton State campus. Um, four, between four and seven is legitimate, but if you're restricting, restricting protests outside of those hours that are not deemed to be hours that are busy, then we're saying that you're using the overbred doctrine. It is closely related to the constitutional cousin of vagueness because there is no explanation or there's no justification for stopping people from gathering peaceably within their constitutional rights. Then we have what is called the vagueness doctrine. This is a regulation of speech that is also unconstitutionally vague. If a reasonable person cannot distinguish between the permission or the permissible and the impermissible speech because of the difficulty encountered in assigning meaning to the language. So vague laws are unconstitutional because the average person would not even know ahead of time whether their expression would violate the law and of course, because of the uncertainty they create, they lead to self-censorship. So a person is going to be checking themselves, they'll be checking the text, and then there's uncertainty. In some cases, it leads to self-censorship to the extent that the message is not necessarily um, um, you know, shared or exercised as a result of that shroud of uncertainty in relation to what the person actually wants to say. On the flip side, an individual may believe that they are actually within their right under the vague law, but the law enforcement's interpretation could be totally different, leading to unjustified arrests or penalties being um, meted out. And so if you go back to the Kennesaw example, or if you go back to, let's say, the Clayton State example, the city prohibited protests on North Avenue, um, then we have a situation where there is a lot of traffic. The law would be considered unconstitutional because what does a lot of traffic mean, all right? Um, there's a lot of traffic mean that there's going to be a traffic backup. There's going to be um, some sort of encumbrance. There has to be that very clear explanation so that it's not leaving anything to doubt in the context of who's actually being exposed. So that's where the vagueness doctrine comes in, all right? And to a person who's just moved, um, you know, to Kennesaw or they've just moved to Clayton County from New York City or Los Angeles, for instance, um, you know, it may never have a lot of traffic, you know, Clayton County may not see seen as having a lot of traffic and more of a group of people who may start to protest when there's no one on North Avenue or the streets leading to Clayton State Campus, 
as the times go by, you'll find that the cars and the people will show up resulting in congested traffic. So this is just an example of the question of whether they'd have to stop for testing since there's a lot of traffic. So saying that there's a lot of traffic does not necessarily explain exactly why you're applying that sort of restriction to the speech situation. So this is the application of the vagueness doctrine that is leaving a lot of questions unanswered in the context of your rights and the rights of people to actually do what they need to do um, within their, their First Amendment rights. So there are a couple of required readings that I'd like you to look at. The Beth Bethel School District, um, number 43 versus Fraser, Tinker versus Des Moines, Independent Community School. Please make sure that you go to these. Um, if it is that it's not there, it should be in D2L. You can just copy and paste, go to your browser, and you'll find all of these cases that are available to help you to understand how the First Amendment has been applied to the past cases, and how have those cases evolved, what precedents have been set. How is it that the um, persons who uh, the court has ruled in favor of, what have been the considerations? How have those particular considerations um, been passed down to what is happening right now in the context of protest? Are we seeing a resurgence of the vagueness doctrine, politically speaking? Is there overreach where the people, you know, the right to assemble is concerned? Um, is there selective um, sorts of application of the law, breaches of the First Amendment on the basis of politics or the particular type of group on the basis of ideology? These are all some things I'd like you to think about as you consider how the First Amendment was framed in the first place and how it is actually applied to what are what, what the things that we're seeing covered in the news and even our very own encounters, if you've ever been involved in a protest, you check to see exactly how that protest has evolved and whether there's been any breach of the rights, your constitutional right to actually be a part of a protest or a petition. So this is where I'll leave you. Again, I'd like to encourage you to watch the video that I posted on the, the you know, First Amendment and the freedom of conscience, as they say, and the reason why we should be allowed to have access to information. And of course, at the same time, the need for us to recognize that in some instances, there are some speeches, types of speeches that are not protected, such as fighting words, all right? So understanding how the First Amendment applies to what is happening in society today, how it's been applied to the last election, and of course, what happened outside and all of the different protests, it would help you to understand why and how laws have been applied to restrict certain gatherings and whether or not those laws have been unconstitutional or a breach of the First Amendment rights of citizens.